Neem, the Half Boy, by Idris Shaw, illustrated by Midori Mori and Robert Revels. Once upon a time, when flies flew backwards and the sun was cool, there was a country called Hitch Hitch, which means nothing at all. This country had a king, and it also had a queen. Now the queen wanted to have a little boy for a son, because she didn't have one. How can I get a little boy? She asked the king. I don't know, I'm sure, the king replied. So the queen asked all the people, and they said, We are very sorry, but we can't tell your majesty how to get a little boy. They called her your majesty, because you always call queens, and kings too, your majesty. So the queen asked the fairies, and they said, We could go and ask Arif, the wise man. The wise man was a very clever man, and he knew everything. So the fairies went to the place where Arif, the wise man, lived, and they said to him, We are the fairies from the country of Hitch Hitch. That country has a queen, and she wants a little boy. But she doesn't know how to get one. I'll tell you how the queen can have a little boy for a son, said Arif the wise man with a smile. And he picked up an apple and he gave it to the fairies, saying, Give this apple to the queen and tell her to eat it. If she eats it, she will have a little boy. So the fairies took the apple and flew back to the queen. Your Majesty, we have been to see the wise man, Arif, who knows everything, they told her. And he says that you should eat this apple. If you eat it, you will have a little boy for a son. The queen was very pleased. She started to eat the apple, but before she had finished it, she forgot how important it was and started thinking about something else. And she dropped the apple, only half eaten. And she did have a little boy. But because she had eaten only half of the apple, the boy she had was a half boy. He had one eye and one ear, one arm and one leg, and he hopped wherever he went. The queen called him Prince Neem, because Neem means half in the language of that country. As he grew bigger, Prince Neem went everywhere on a horse. As a half boy, he could get around better on a horse because he didn't have to hop. He became very clever at riding his horse. And he grew to be a very clever little boy in every way. But he got bored with being a half boy. And he used to say, I would like to be a whole boy. How can I become a whole boy? And the queen would answer, I'm sure I don't know. And the king would say, I have no idea at all. And the fairies, when they came to hear about it, said, Perhaps we should go and ask the wise man who knows everything. How Prince Neem can become a whole boy. So the fairies flew through the air to the place where Arif, the wise man, lived. And they said to him, 
We are the fairies who came to see you about the Queen of Hitch Hitch, who wanted a little boy. But he is only a half boy, and he wants to be a whole boy. Can you help him? And Arif the wise man sighed and said, The queen ate only half the apple. That is why she had only a half boy. But since that was so long ago, she cannot eat the other half. It must have gone bad by now. Well, is there anything that Neem the half boy can do to become a whole boy? asked the fairies. Tell Neem, the half-boy, that he can go to see Tanin, the fire-breathing dragon. He lives in a cave and is annoying everyone around by blowing fire all over them. The half-boy will find a special, wonderful medicine in Tanin's cave. If he drinks it, he will become a whole boy. Go and tell him that, said Arif, the wise man. So the fairies flew into the air, and they didn't stop flying until they came to the palace where the king and the queen and Neem, the half-boy, lived. When they got there, they found Prince Neem and said to him, we have been to see Arif, the wise man, who is very clever and knows everything. He told us to tell you that you must drive out Tanin the dragon, who is annoying the people. In the back of his cave, you will find the special, wonderful medicine, which will make you into a whole boy. Prince Neem thanked the fairies, got on his horse, and trotted it to the cave where Tanin the dragon was sitting, breathing fire all over the place. Now I am going to drive you out, dragon, cried Prince Neem to Tanin. But why should you? asked Tanin. And Prince Neem said, I am going to drive you away because you keep breathing fire all over people, and they don't like it. I must breathe fire because I have to cook my food. If I had a stove to do my cooking on, I wouldn't have to do it, replied Tanin sadly. I could give you a stove to do your cooking on, but I must still drive you out, said the prince. And the dragon replied, Why should you, if I stopped breathing fire over people? I would have to get you to go, because you have got a special, wonderful medicine in the back of your cave. If I drink it, I can become a whole boy. And I want to be a whole boy very much, said Neem. But I could give you the medicine so that you would not have to drive me away to get it. You could drink it and you would become a whole boy. Then you could go and get me a stove and I would be able to do my cooking, and I wouldn't have to blow fire all over people, said the dragon. So Neem waited while the dragon went into the back of his cave. Presently, Tanin came back with a bottle of the special, wonderful medicine. Prince Neem drank it all down, and in less time than it takes to tell, he grew another arm, another side, another leg, another ear, and everything. He had become a whole boy, 
and he was very, very pleased. He got on his horse and rode quickly back to the palace at Hitch Hitch. There, he fetched a cooking stove and took it back to Tanin. And after that, Tanin the dragon lived quietly in his cave and never blew fire over anyone again. And all the people were very happy. From then on, Meem the half-boy was called Kul, which means the whole boy in the language of Hitch Hitch. It would have been silly of him to be called a half-boy when he was a whole one, wouldn't it? And everyone lived happily forevermore. A lot of the 20th century research and into the 21st century has been in trying to find out how children learn to get themselves into the world, how they learn how things operate in the world, how they learn to put things together. There's an awful lot to think about. Uh, how you get dressed to go to school, why you wear different clothes at different times, how you eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, whether you have sweet stuff before uh, sour stuff, uh, how you sing, how you act towards people you know versus people you don't know. If you actually think about what you do, you'll realize that you have hundreds of different routines in your mind about how to act. Now, most of the research that started was on simple association, hit, ball, dog, bark, etc. Uh, and while it's important at really the age of two to be able to do things like that, it doesn't really tell you about how to operate in the world, how to get on the bus to go to school, how to read a book, when to talk, when you're free to scream and run around, when you're free not to, how to deal with unexpected challenges, how to deal with your family as opposed to other people. So something more complicated has to be very important in how we deal with things. And many scientists, psychologists, child development scientists, psychiatrists, have begun to feel that the way in which people learn is in stories. Uh, they may be simple stories, like how to go to the drugstore and buy something. They may be complicated stories, like what do I have to do in order to get married? or what do I have to do if I want to be a fireman? But they're still stories. They are things that link events together in a meaningful way. They're not very simple. Of course, it's very important to know how to read. Uh, it's very important to know how to use language. But it's also very important to know how all these words, how all these concepts come together uh, in order to make something that's really meaningful for ourselves. The best way to think about this is stories, that we have stories about ourselves, we have stories about other people, we have stories about our life, we have stories about our country's life, we have our stories about political life, uh, etc. And that we key them up, we tell each other them, etc. So it's no accident that stories have been found to be very important in cognitive development. Certain stories, though, are a little different than just the put your clothes on before you go to school type stories. Uh, they've re-occurred uh, and reoccurred throughout the world. Uh, they've been shown, for instance, by the author Idris Shah to occur in culture after culture with pretty much the same structure. So for instance, there's a Cinderella that was invented and told by the Algonquin Indians. Um, there are stories that are pretty universal throughout all cultures, and they've been collected, uh, especially by Idris Shah, uh, for the current, um, for current learning and teaching. Now, why is it important that there are these universal stories? It's because these stories contain important elements of learning 
uh, for children and for adults, elements that are not really replaceable in any other way. Their very universality shows that they're very important to the basic process of becoming human. This special kind of story is a form of literature that's not very known in the West, but it's been common in the Middle East and Central Asia, especially in countries like Afghanistan, Iran, other Central Asian countries. Um, it helps develop thinking skills and perceptions because it introduces kids and adults to events in unusual combinations. The psychological significance of these stories has only recently, really only in about the last 30 years, been rediscovered in the West. And they're called teaching stories as opposed to the normal kind of stories which kids uh, read. Some of, them, some of the more normal kind of stories may be stories with morals, how to act, how to behave, how to be a proper person. Teaching stories tell you a little more about yourself, how to look at yourself in unfamiliar situations, and they prepare you for the unfamiliar events that may happen later in life, and they develop the mind in unexpected ways. These teaching stories can often appear to be little more than fairy tales or folk tales. In fact, Fairy tales and folk tales have at their origin many teaching stories, and this is the way they've been able to seep into the culture. Uh, but they're designed to embody in their characters, in their plots, and in their imagery patterns and relationships that nurture a part of the mind that can't be reached any other way. Um, they increase our understanding and our breadth of vision. These are stories, just like the one you've just heard, that have unusual occurrences in them, unusual things that go on, different ways of dealing with a situation. For instance, you might consider how Neem confronts the dragon in this story. He doesn't confront him in the normal way, and we can, uh, we can talk about that later. Most of our daily life is pretty predictable. Um, we have pretty ordinary routines. We get up, kids go to school, they learn at school, they come home, they have their games, they have their life events. These stories are designed to introduce into people, uh, adults and children, unusual events, occurrences that normally don't happen, uh, even in the safe and comforting harbor of a uh, storytelling situation. When they do that, they prepare the mind to develop more flexibility and to understand the complexities of the world a little better. Now, most children won't have encountered so many unusual situations, obviously, but these stories especially get them prepared to look at the world in a more complex, um, and a more complex way and a way in which um, they can develop more context. Now we'll hear the second story in this series. It's called The Clever Boy and the Terrible Dangerous Animal. The Clever Boy and the Terrible Dangerous Animal by Idris Shaw, illustrated by Rosemary Santiago. Once upon a time, there was a very clever boy who lived in a village. Nearby was another village that he had never visited. When he was old enough to be allowed to go about on his own, he thought he would like to see the other village. So one day, he asked his mother if he could go, and she said, yes, as long as you look both ways before you cross the road. You must be very careful. The boy agreed and set off at once. When he got to the side of the road, he looked both ways. And because there was nothing coming, 
he knew he could cross safely. And that's just what he did. Then he skipped down the road towards the other village. Just outside that village, he came upon a crowd of people who were standing in a field. And he went up to them to see what they were doing. As he drew near, he heard them saying, Woo! and ah! Oh, and oh! And he saw that they looked quite frightened. He went up to one of the men and said, Why are you saying ooh and ah and oh? And why are you all so frightened? Oh dear me, said the man. There is a terrible, dangerous animal in this field. And we are all very frightened because it might attack us. Where is the terrible, dangerous animal? asked the boy, looking around. Oh, be careful, be careful, cried the people. But the clever boy asked again, Where is the terrible, dangerous animal? And so the people pointed to the middle of the field. And when the boy looked where they pointed, he saw a very large watermelon. That's not a terrible, dangerous animal, laughed the boy. Yes, it is. It is, cried the people. Keep away. It might bite you. Now the boy saw that these people were very silly indeed. So he said to them, I'll go and kill this dangerous animal for you. No, no, cried the people. It's too terrible. It's too dangerous. It might bite you. Ooh, ah, uh, oh. But the boy went right up to the watermelon, took a knife out of his pocket, and cut a large slice out of it. The people were astonished. What a brave boy, they said. He's killed the terrible, dangerous animal. As they spoke, the boy took a bite out of the large slice of watermelon. It tasted delicious. Look, cried the people. Now he's eating the terrible, dangerous animal. He must be a terrible, dangerous boy. As the boy walked away from the middle of the field, waving his knife and eating the watermelon, the people ran away, saying, Don't attack us, you terrible, dangerous boy. Keep away. At this, the boy laughed again. He laughed and laughed and laughed. And then the people wondered why he was laughing. So they crept back. What are you laughing at? They asked timidly. You're such a silly lot of people, said the boy. You don't know that what you call a dangerous animal is just a watermelon. Watermelons are very nice to eat. We've got lots of them in our village, and everyone eats them. Then the people became interested, and someone said, Well, how do we get watermelons? You take the seeds out of a watermelon, and you plant them like this, he said putting a few of the seeds in the ground. Then you give them water and look after them. And after a while, lots and lots of watermelons will grow from the seeds. So the people did what the boy showed them. 
And now, in all the fields of that village, they have lots and lots and lots of watermelons. They sell some, and they eat some, and they give some away. And that's why their village is called Watermelon Village. And just think, it all happened because a clever boy was not afraid when a lot of silly people thought something was dangerous just because they had never seen it before. Now, I've said these stories are very different from ordinary reading and writing. And in order to see how, that, how different they were, I set up a series of studies to see what happens inside the brain when people are listening to these kinds of stories. Um, I found that when people are reading, teaching stories, it activates the right side of the brain much more than does reading ordinary prose. So if you're reading these stories filled with vivid imagery, filled with unusual occurrences, the right hemisphere of the brain gets more active than if you're reading, say, a history of the Peloponnesian War or more normal reading. Now why is that important and what does it mean? There have been a lot of theories for a long time about how the two sides of the brain works, whether the right hemisphere is the really good side and the left is the bad side, etc. But those are much too simple. Think of it this way. Think of the difference between text and context. Um, when you're reading something, you need to know what each and every word means. You need to know uh, where Paris is. You need to know what an airplane is. You need to know that airplane is spelled A-A-R-P-L-A-N-E, etc. But unless you can put everything together, you don't have any context. You just have a bunch of simple words. If you're looking at a room, for instance, what you see is a bunch of lines up and down, um, left and right. But they don't come together to make a room unless you know that you're in a room. So it's been found in a number of studies that the left hemisphere of the brain deals in lots of different situations with the elements of a situation. The lines that make up a room, for instance. The individual words that make up a sentence. The right side of the brain deals with context. Uh, how these words are put together, how the lines are put together to make a room, how, where you are in space, etc. So meaning isn't part of one side of the brain or the other. You can't have a story without words. You can't have a story also without knowing what the words mean and how they fit together. What this means in these stories is that the the teaching stories stimulate the area of the brain that has to do with context, that has to do with putting words together, that has to do with putting things together with relationship to oneself. And this is one reason why they're so important. You ever bought something? You see a picture of a bicycle. You want to buy it for yourself or for your child. It comes from UPS, and there it is. It's a bunch of pieces. They're all laid out. There are a set of instructions, but you can't ride it. You can't go anywhere with it. You can't do anything with it. It's the pieces of a bicycle, but it's not a bicycle. In this metaphor that I'm using, what the left hemisphere does is it kind of produces the pieces. Now, there's a lot of work in producing the pieces of a bicycle, but it's still not a bicycle until someone knows how to put it together. If you're like me, that's not you. But in fact, uh, most people know how to do this. The right side of the brain is the side that puts together the pieces of the puzzle of life. It puts together things into an organized whole wherein we can operate 
we can live our life, and we can be prepared to know how to act in different situations. Some of them may be unexpected, some of them may be just routine, but without it, we wouldn't know where to go, we wouldn't know how to go, it would be just like having a bunch of pieces unassembled of a bicycle which nobody ever put together for us. This is context, and it's what the stories provide how to link items together, and this gives the child or an adult a picture of what's going on, how to act, and what may befall him or her in the future. And of course, the act of reading stories to the child also affects the adult. These stories are designed to have effects on both the reader and the person who's being read to. The child may learn to anticipate what's going on in this and many other stories, but the adult may also have his or her mind taken along some unfamiliar lines. Let's go back to the first story for a second just to uh, remind you of one of the things I'm talking about. I mentioned it just a bit earlier. There are lots and lots of stories where the hero fights and defeats the dragon, but this story is very different. What happens in this story? Neem tells the dragon he'll have to drive him out of his cave because he's breathing fire over everyone. Then the dragon explains what's happening. He recognizes his problem, and he even knows the solution, but he needs help. To Neem, the dragon knows he needs help to stop breathing fire over everyone, and he knows Neem can help him once he's whole. So at one level, this is about helping each other through negotiation and cooperation, and it's not confrontational at all. It's a different way to look at conflicts. It's a different way to resolve different situations. And it may give you a different insight into the way people are structured. It could be that someone, for instance, who has a lot of force in their life uh, at some time is really lacking a place to put that force. Uh, and there are many, many other interpretations, all of which I'm sure you'll be able to think about. But what this story does is it gives you a look at just a slightly different way of looking at things. And of course, the Bellin story as well gives you a look at a different way to look at something that might be considered dangerous. These kinds of things are obviously very important for kids in today's world and for adults. And as we work more and more with these teaching stories, we see their relevance to changing circumstances in our life and in the life of our culture, which is why these stories are so continuously interesting and so continuously rewarding. And um, they not only have an effect on the mind and cognitive development, but on the brain and on future actions of us and our children. Thank you.